The four. Organization. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You are listening to the most informational packed hour of Garden Focus Radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers. To find the right size for your digging projects, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you're listening to us on one of the 16 radio stations that are broadcasting our program across the country here in 2020 through a radio app through our website that is the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com under the season four tab at the top of the page podcast replay or in studio video replay we thank you for that i'm your host joy baird beside me is my wife co-host best friend and gardening partner hi baird this program is all about you for you to help your garden grow better to have healthier trees to maintain your landscape and your yard, indoors and out, plus preserving what you grow. There are several ways in which you can reach us during the program, after the program. Anytime you have a question, you can get a hold of us by email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can also call us anytime, day or night, 24-7, 365. That number is 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. we got a big show for you today. We're going to talk about getting your fall garden ready to go. Now, we're, we're just getting close. To, uh, we're just in the beginning stages of July, but we got to get prepared now in order to have the dominoes, so to speak, fall at the proper time and hit the right things. So we're going to talk about getting your fall garden ready to go. In the segment one and segment two, we're going to talk about powdery mildew. We Some of you are facing that problem right now. Others are soon to be facing it. So we'll go over what it is and what to look for and how to treat it. And then uh, from the YouTuber and blogger from The Impatient Gardener, Aaron, uh, Aaron what is it, Holly? Shannon. Aaron, Aaron Shannon will be with us and we'll answer your garden questions. So let's talk about fall planting, Holly. It's... Again, beginning portions of July, and we need to begin to prepare and get things ready to go for the garden. As Joey had mentioned, many people think that after Labor Day... Pack it up, take it home. Pack it up, take it home. So you're just done, I guess, um, which to me is way too soon, especially because that's the beginning of September. And I mean, you can at least garden until October... Right. Well, right, so. and and there and there is some community gardens that shut down at a, Labor, like, Day. Labor Day, that mm-hmm. type of thing, which is just that's sad. I'm yeah, sad for all the tomatoes. So, like here in Wisconsin, you you if we have a nice beginning end of summer, beginning fall, I mean, you can get tomatoes sometimes through November. We but. we've had them the first uh, end of the first second week in November. Now yeah. that was an, an oddity, but it did occur. But even like you know till October, whatever. So, but. Those are those are already established crops. So we're talking about new crops or cool weather crops um, that can handle a frost, um, but not a hard freeze. So, for example, you would start these or put these in the ground beginning of August. Right. It, 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 they're cool. Where you, they're where you cool are. weather crops, but they can handle that heat on the early stages of development, and then as those daytime links get shorter. And the nighttime temperatures get cooler. These crops thrive much better than they do in the spring, because in the opposite realm, in the spring we're planting them as earlier and, and try to get them out. Oh, it's going to freeze. It's going to frost. Get them out, and then the days are getting longer and warmer. And that's what these plants do not like. Right. Uh, so that we find, and we'll talk about, it, there's some crops in which we only plant in the fall because we've never had any great success in the spring planting them. So I think the the step you're going to take right now um, is deciding 
where you're going to put these. Well, well, before that, before that, let's see if we even can, if we have the seeds in which we need, well, that too. and then try to go find that because in the situation we're in in 2020, you can find seeds anywhere right now. Uh, you're a very fortunate gardener because a lot of places have completely bare bones scrapped out every seed that they had. Because okay, so yeah. you want to establish seeds um, somehow, whether you have them, whether you obtain them, whether you beg your neighbor for seeds, whatever you need to do. Um, so if you have seeds, then you want to determine where you're going to plant this and what you want to plant. So, for example, if you want to plant garlic, that's going to take up about nine months worth of time. And this really isn't necessarily fall planting. It's just something to keep in the back of your head. So there's that that one. But then anything from beets, a lot of um, more root crops. Yeah, are, well, are you going to bring, you know, like you said, do you have a vacancy available are you bringing in new grow bags from Root Maker and filling them and planting those? Are you ripping out uh, the the summer crops as those get done and planning on putting more uh, product in that real estate? What are you you know What are you going to do? You got to have a plan here, right? So you have to think about that. Now, the longest cool weather crop or fall crop, whatever you want to call it, is broccoli, which takes about eighty five to one hundred days. So you want to take that in consideration. You probably would want to start that sooner than August 1st, well, depending yeah. where you are. Yeah. It, explain, okay, for the, the, what we're looking at here, the key date is it's not your, it's your first average first frost in the fall. Right. So that's going to give you an idea of when your first frost How can occur. we find that information? You just go to your favorite search engine and you type in f- uh, fall frost date or first, yeah, first frost date and you can put in your zip code. And it will it'll navigate you to a very close... But uh, it's thing. good to keep in mind that you might share a zip code with some varying varying geographical geographical like small pocket climates. Like where we live, we are closer to Lake Michigan. So we have kind of a different climate than the same zip code which is further inland. So it's ki- it's kind Any of Any given day to, it's 10 degrees different. Right. So that's something to, to definitely keep and in mind. And then whenever you look at the pack of seeds, now all of these that we're going to talk about can handle a light, uh, can handle a frost and a, a slight freeze. But when we talk about a freeze, we're talking like 25, 20, 18. Most of these, even in a mature state, are very unlikely to survive that. So you're looking at the package of the seeds, days to maturity. What does that mean? So what that means is that that is when your when those crops are going to fruit right from the time you put it in the seed or create a, a, a edible vegetable right uh, so if you put a broccoli seed in the ground 100 days from that that's the days to maturity if you take a broccoli seed start it in a tray in a shaded area on your porch patio or deck and then you plant it it's still that length of time but you've got a healthy plant that you've started and it would be recommended, and, and some of these are root crops, so you want to direct sow. The other ones, you can start them direct seed right in the ground. However, because it's going to be hot, it's going to be more of a challenge to keep moisture around that seed. So it almost would be smart to start them in starter trays, get them established as a, a baby a baby plant, then put them out so you have a full row of plants and there's no plants missing because of a lack of a germination. Right. So that's definitely something to keep in mind um also are you if you don't have space maybe you want to get some grow bags or containers or whatever to add space so you want to keep that in mind where you're going to put those is that an option for you maybe this is the first time you've heard of fall planting and you're like this is something i want to do i want to try but i don't have any space so there's an option for you a container of some sort so let's go over what what are some of then there's a lot of we're just going to kind of go over more of the popular ones here uh that you can start uh for fall and based on where you're at we're not going to say you have to start it on this this day but we're going to give you the variety and then the days to harvest or the days to reach to a mature state then you can kind of gauge on where you're at so we'll start with beets They take about 70 days to harvest. They are root crops, so you're going to direct sow them. And you're going to have to thin them out. Otherwise, you're not going to get a bulb. You're going to get a lot of beet greens or top growth because they come in a cluster seed, and and that's just the way nature is. And the same thing for carrots. They take about 70 70 days to harvest. And broccoli, as we had mentioned, is the 85 to 100 days. Lettuce is a little bit quicker. This is leaf lettuce. This is not iceberg head lettuce. Uh, that's 45 days. And then radishes take 30 days. So th- radishes are your quickest. 
And if you have little kids or maybe even yourself are a little bit impatient, you can definitely grow radishes and you feel very successful quickly. So, for example, let's say your first average frost date is October 20th. You could start these radishes middle of September. You don't need to start them too early because they will they are heat sensitive, daylight sensitive, and they'll go to bolt very quickly before you get a bulb. So the chill in the air, they really thrive on that type of development. And the quickness of it, you don't have to rush to get them in the ground as quickly as you would have to like a broccoli that takes eighty five to one hundred days. Right. Um, and then spinach is the forty five days or so. Now, Disclaimer on on the spinach: You don't have to wait until you get the big bulky leaves. Like right, you, you, could, you yeah, could harvest it sooner. Baby baby spinach. Mm-hmm, correct. Now these are ones that we like to grow in the fall, and this includes turnips and rutabagas. Turnips are kind of smaller, so they take about sixty days. Rutabagas are a little bit bigger, so they take about ninety. But if you if you plant them at the same time, you can harvest those rutabagas a little bit sooner. It's not a huge a huge problem. Uh, garlic is a fall crop. People do plant it in the spring. We've experimented with it with smaller bulb size, uh, but we always plant it the first Saturday in October each year. We'll have a segment coming up in a few weeks on the great way or the, the best way to grow a successful garlic. Uh, we'll cover that in more detail. Uh, but yeah, you want to. It, it takes nine months, as you talked about earlier. A lot of real estate used up, but it's very, very worth it. Uh, if you've never grown garlic in your own garden in your own flower bed in your own side bed uh you're missing out right um and then peas peas are fun to grow especially if you if you had a spring that maybe they weren't Uh -uh. (laughs) they weren't successful you can try them in the fall those take 70 to 80 days and yeah we got lettuce Cauliflower. cauliflower 50 to 100 days and then Swiss chard is 50 days, and Swiss chard is very hardy, so mm-hmm. you can. it's one of those ones that you can leave for a while. And with the spinach and with the, the Swiss chard, you want to harvest the outer larger leaves and leave the smaller leaves to develop, and you work that cycle. The, the big ones harvest, and then you har- leave the little ones alone. And then uh, kale is 30 to 50 days based on your variety. There's several different types of kale available. Uh, but now's the time to start getting these things figured out, what seeds you have, what seeds you might be able to scrounge up online uh, based on what uh, like seedsavers.com uh, has uh, available still as they've had a record year because of everybody deciding that, you know, we can't do anything. Let's uh, plant a garden and see what we can make happen of that. So um, it's, it's worth a try. But with any of these, don't think that, oh, we're just going to go in and plant these things and everything's going to be unicorns and, and jelly beans. There are going to be problems. You will fa- There are still going to be insects. Unicorn rainbows and pots of gold. Yeah, there's still going to be insects mm-hmm. that will damage some of these crops. You will have crop failure. That's just part of the whole thing. Especially when you get to, when you get past Labor Day, if you have to listen for frost warnings and hard freeze warnings, especially where we are, because all of a sudden you could have one night that could wipe out a lot of your plants. So you would want to pay attention so you cover those. And these, these are hardy enough that can handle most of those type of temperature fluctuations. Right, but you just still want to be aware. So thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our 18th show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talked about canning what you grow, how gardening is effective for mental health. Our guest was Marion Nessel. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast, or we'll make it even easier to find them. Send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and in the subject line, put show 17, and we will send you the link. We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We will be talking about how to deal with powdery mildew. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. If you love growing tomatoes, then you've got to try Tomato Secret by Dr. Jim. 
At the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, we stand behind Tomato Secret and recommend it to all gardeners who would easily like to grow higher quality tomatoes with more color, more flavor, and less bugs and disease. Tomato Secret is specifically designed to grow high quality tomatoes that is made with 12 natural ingredients so pure that you can feed it to a cow. Simply apply one cup in the hole at planting and sprinkle one cup around the plant after one month. That is all it takes for the best tomatoes on earth. With this product, you do not have to guess what is wrong with your tomato plant because it has everything your plants need to be healthy and and produce the most delicious fruit. You'll never grow tomatoes the same again. Grow the largest, juiciest, and most delicious tomatoes on earth. To find out more about Tomato Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night, dries clear, and odorless. It will not clog your sprayer. Deer Defeat works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Safe, effective, and works on rabbits. Money-back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use code RADIO to save 10% on your order. Deer Defeat. It can't be beat. Crop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door for free. Chip Drop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to chipdrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. Tired of breaking your back while pulling weeds? Worrying about spraying chemicals around plants you want to keep? Chapin has the solution with the Weed Devil. The Chapin Weed Devil is a compact, lightweight, long-handled weed-killing machine. Powered with a rechargeable battery, you can start spraying with the touch of a button. Just choose your favorite herbicide, fill the tank, and spot spray as needed. To order the Chapin Weed Devil, visit www.chapinmfg.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it, tomatosnaps.com. Responsible watering, accurate, fast, and efficient. Earth conscious. Visit waterhoop. Com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for hanging around. We're going to talk about a problem that, if you're not facing it, you will soon face it, and that's powdery mildew. We're going to go w over what is it, how do you, uh, what what to identify it is, why it happens, and how one can at least combat or reduce the impact in which it has on the plants that it can devastate. Powdery mildew is one of those plant, one of those diseases that. You you pretty much know when you have it. It right. looks like it looks like somebody came and sprinkled powder on your squash, your viney plants, cucumber, cucumber watermelon, pumpkins. grapes, beans, peas. Uh, there's even flowers that are severely affected by the uh, the powder mildew. So it's easy to identify. Um, you will know because they have those powdery spots. If you think you got it, you probably have it. <laughs> right, um, and it, this is through spores that drift into your garden. 
And so what they do is they come through the wind or however they drift over, whether it be from your neighbor's yard or who knows from where. And they also can come from dormant spores that were in old vegetation or old weeds nearby. So here is a good reason to clean out any old vegetation. Maybe if you had powdery mildew in the past, make sure you throw that away. Don't compost it. Don't burn it. Throw it away. Right. People are like, oh, compost. It'll get hot enough. The most backyards, unless you're in a tumbler that you can control the temperature, you're probably not going to have that core temperature warm up for the majority of gardeners. There are some that are very uh, particular about the temperature in which those the compost pile is, whether it's a tumbler or a pile, uh, but you're not going to, it's better just to throw it out in the trash. And if your city doesn't allow that, put it in the bottom and then put some trash on top of it and then put, you know, sandwich it in between some stuff. They're not going to notice. Right. So it, th- it does thrive in warm, dry climates. So it requires a fairly high relative humidity, ID, like uh, humidity around the plant itself, not necessarily the daytime humidity, but if there's a lot of humidity around the plant. So about 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 to 27 degrees Celsius is when this is going to occur. But then once it gets warmer, higher than 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius, it, it seems to be slowing down by that. There's there's a there's a Goldilocks effect where everything's perfect and all these spores are starting com- to combine and they create the powdery mildew. Now a couple of reasons why it may be more intensified in your garden could be because of the spacing of the plants. We always want to pack more into an area than probably what is required. We do the same thing. If it says you can put four in that area, we try to squeeze five in the area, and then the plants are overlapping one another, and then the wind takes the spores from plant one and affects the plants down the row uh, because they're not social distanced properly. <laughs> and then other things like bugs will take it, insects will walk across limb, leaves and transfer that mildew onto the adjacent plants that wasn't infected. So our, our plants need to social distance from from communicable uh, diseases and disorders. Yeah, right? we don't have enough time in this show to talk about all that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so you want to make sure and, you and that's the other, yeah, that's the other thing with growing, like, like for example, growing cucumbers, vining them on the ground versus vertically growing them. It exposes them more to the air and, and allows, you know, more visual ex- inspection. In addition, uh, it's easier to harvest, but you're able to see things quicker. Now, if you have plant one and you begin to see the developmental stages of powdery mildew and plant two, three, and four has no infect infestation that you can tell you can remove up to 25 percent of plant one's limbs and leaves however you want to be sure you have a trash bag right there because it those spores will get in your hand they'll get in the wind as you drag them across the garden they can infect not only your other zucchini plants but if you've got peas next to them or cucumbers uh, you may be introducing that into those uh, environments as well with those, on those plants so Keep in mind that you can cut up to 25% of the foliage back on them, but you want to be cautious of how you remove it from the actual location where the plant is at in your garden. Definitely. So there are some things you can do. One is you can water from overhead. This will help um, wash those spores off the leaves. Now people are like, whoa, whoa, that's what causes it. Well, that's kind of a myth where there's water laying on the leaves and it doesn't dry off in time. Uh, Now, this is not a 100%, let's clean the leaves off with the overhead watering mechanism. Uh, It has some effect, but if you're going to do such in this manner, you would want to do it early in the morning, early in the afternoon, so the leaves don't go to bed wet. That can cause other issues if you have a bunch of, you know, squash leaves or pumpkin leaves that are very moist and it gets dark and they don't have time to dry out. Now, obviously, when it rains, you have no control over that. We're trying to minimize the impact in which we have on the plants in which we're growing in our garden. Right. So you can you can use a few different things. Now there are some chemicals that you can purchase and use. Otherwise, you can mix one teaspoon of baking soda with one quart of water. So that's your uh, ratio is one teaspoon of baking soda, one quart of water. And you spray the plants thoroughly as the solution will only kill the fungus that it comes in contact with. 
So that's a that's something that you can do. Now, if you don't have the if you're if if you're go out if you go out in your garden this weekend and everything is just beautiful, wonderful, you can apply this mixture on the plant's leaves to be proactive instead of reactive, and that will at least you know you have a better chance because what you're doing is you're cleaning the leaves off, you're creating, you're changing the pH level on that leaf to allow that fungal, that powdery mildew not to develop. Just like in your bathroom, if you have air circulation and the right temperature, the mold doesn't grow in certain areas as if it was just stagnant, warm conditions in the corner of the tub type of example. Right, and that's one thing to mention. If you've had this issue in the past, maybe you didn't know you had this issue, and now you do, and you didn't realize that, like, Maybe you're going to have this issue again. Because if you you're didn't... a new gardener, you yeah. should at least do some image searches online to know what this is because this can de devastate your crops if you don't catch it in time or not or you're not aware of it. All right. So you just maybe go ahead, look into it, and then make you know make a, a proactive move. Um, so vinegar is another solution. And you would take two to three tablespoons of vinegar. So this is a little bit of a more diluted solution uh two to three tablespoons of vinegar you can use like a common apple cider vinegar and mix that with one gallon of water you don't want to do too much because you don't want to be like oh less more is good right you, no, you, you want to keep it. <laughs> don't spray your green gobbler 20 percent horticultural right. omri listed vinegar on it because you're going to burn the plant yeah you don't want to burn your plant so you want to do this whether it be the baking soda or the vinegar before you see any problems and it's going to help you immensely so and then now the, the, that's just two different recipes in which you can go ahead and experiment with um on your or uh, not experiment but pr be proactive instead of reactive if you want to get a bunch of different recipes because you may not have a certain ingredient you may have mouthwash instead of vinegar whatever the case is because that is another mixture in which you can make you can search online, go to your favorite search engine, and search powdery mildew, growing a greener world, or a powdery mildew Joe Lample, uh, who is the host of the PBS's, PBS program, Growing a Greener World. He's got a, a really good article that breaks this down and gives those home recipes uh, for the mixtures in which will work. Now, does this, if you go ahead and see powdery mildew on your plants and you go and take the vinegar or the baking soda and spray out there, this does not mean that tomorrow the plant is happy and waving at you and everything's great. Sometimes it, it will slow the mildew down, but it doesn't eliminate or remove it off the leaves. So I think that's how you could use a combination of removing the leaves and also spraying this and remove it from the leaves that look the worst or the most affected and then spray it so that it helps kind of stop the problem. But definitely if you're a new gardener or maybe you've had this issue before, I would do this beforehand. I would use the baking soda, I think, before I came with the vinegar. And you want to spray the top of the leaves. You get a you get a pump sprayer from Chapin. Uh, and if you're going to do the vinegar, they've got a vinegar sprayer that's designed. They've got industrial parts where because vinegar will eat through anything. Uh, so you can do that with the the Chapin vinegar sprayer. And you spray the top of the leaves. You spray the under the leaves. You soak that down because you want to disrupt that pH level on that leaf and then it may be too late this year to to uh, utilize this information but you don't want to have the cucumbers butted right up next to the zucchini right up next to the watermelon right up next to the peas because all of those are susceptible to powdery mildew um, uh, squashes pumpkins cucumbers melons the nightshade tomatoes eggplants peppers roses legumes peas can all be uh, uh, subject to uh, being uh, affected by powdery mildew in some form or fashion. Um, so the biggest thing is that um, you want to make sure that if you do get powdery mildew, that if you are going to remove some of the foliage, that you make sure you, you throw it away, you toss it right away, you don't drag it through your garden. And if you have maybe garden an area of your garden right now, that's a little a little weedy or something. You maybe have tossed some some bad old leaves or something back there, or whatever. That you clean that up, get it out of there. And if you're if you've had this problem before, 
keep that in mind. If it's a new problem, maybe be a little bit proactive. And if you're uncertain, you can certainly take an image, a photograph with your mobile device and send it to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's how you can get a hold of us and we can help identify the problem because we want you to be successful. We're here to help you. And if we can't uh, diagnose the uh, imagery because we may not know it, we've got other people in the chain of command that have experience that we can say, hey, you've been around a couple more years than we have. What do you think this is? And we can always get you uh, help with your situation. Well, another thing we can help you with is those Japanese beetles that you probably got knocking on your back door and bouncing in your head, bouncing in your, bouncing off your head while you're walking through the garden because the temperature is warmed up. It's summertime now and various beetles, weevils, boars, and those annoying Japanese beetles are in your garden and destroying what you've worked so hard for to try to get eating. And what better way to prevent these pests from destroying your garden than by controlling them while they are larvae? How can we control them? Grub Gone is an easy-to-apply granule product that can spread onto your turf successfully to control grub invaders. This is developed by Phylum Bioproducts from our naturally occurring bacteria. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT product that specifically targets only certain scarab pests. And it is safe to use around bees and other beneficial insects. If you already have those beetles flying around, we do. I'm sure you do as well. If you're uncertain, uh, take a look and do an image search of what Japanese beetles look like, and you'll be disappointed knowing that they're in your garden. You can use Beetle Gone. It is an organic water dispersible powder that can be sprayed directly, yes, directly on your edible plants. Find out more on how to purchase at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P H Y. L-L-O-M, bioproducts.com. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, it's the host of the Inpatient Gardener on YouTube. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, a program to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, make your trees look a little happier, preserving what you grow. We're going to help you indoors and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at powerplanter.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Trim Bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with the static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Tree Ripe Citrus Company has top quality produce that comes right to your neighborhood with the freshest peaches and blueberries you'll find. To find locations, go to tree-ripe.com. Do not settle for the rest when you can have the best peaches and blueberries with Tree Ripe Citrus Company. Go to tree-ripe.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. For all your indoor growing needs, equipment, and supplies, it's WeGrowIndoors.com. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah.
The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Spartan Mosquito, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Summer is here and you've got jobs to get done on your property. And where can you find the materials that you need in order to accomplish the jobs, whether it's gravel, whether it's sand, whether it's wood chips, whether it's mulch, it all can be found at Blue Mouse Landscape and Garden Center. They're located at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton in Greenfield. You can find them at bluemouse.com. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220, and you can have them deliver the product right to your driveway or your backyard or your front yard. And based on the current situation, you may actually be able to go pick it up if you have the right type of equipment to do such also they can do landscape consultations and if you're tired of mowing the grass they can take care of that for you as well bluemills.com now back to the wisconsin vegetable gardener radio show which is presented to you by power planter earth augers the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project visit powerplanter.com now here are your hosts joey and holly baird Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Holly, let's go to our hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Aaron Shannon is a blogger, plant enthusiast, avid YouTube gardener, and gardens in Zone 5B in Wisconsin. She has been featured in a number of magazines. She is also a garden speaker. Her website is theimpatientgardener.com. Welcome to the program, Aaron. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day. I know you're doing uh, some pretty big projects there on the YouTube channel, and we thank you for uh, joining not only Holly and myself, but all of our listeners from across the country. I'm so excited to to talk to everybody. Great. Um, so you are called the Impatient Gardener. Why Why is that your name or your What's title? What's the secret behind it? Well, don't you think all gardeners are a little bit impatient? I think we all sort of, it takes a while to learn. And certainly when I created the blog, The Impatient Gardener back in 2009, I was a semi new gardener and I was really um, quite enthusiastic, but perhaps not completely realistic. And, uh, you know, it's something that I have definitely learned over the years, although I still sort of struggle a little bit with that. Um, you know, that sit back and, and recognize that Mother Nature is pretty much in control and all we can do is sort of adapt and do our best. And sometimes it's out of your hands. So um, it's just kind of how that all started was that I was ready for some instantaneous results. And we all know that is not something that happens in gardens. Were you one of those people that watched a lot of TV and saw there wasn't an issue was boom, plant the first eight minutes, harvest the last eight minutes, everything was perfect, not a problem in the world type of uh, intake? Absolutely. I, I readily confess to being completely taken by sort of the television model of gardening and, you know, all the DIY projects, you know, everything gets done in 20 minutes like magic. Yeah, and there's never a problem, and, and everything fits the first time. It's 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 wonderful how that all works. <laughs> right. Yeah, and then you and then reality strikes, and you realize that is not how it goes. But that's also, you know, part of the joy, part of the joy of gardening as well as those challenges. Definitely, it's funny. My my manager at work, it's his first year growing vegetables, and he has a lot of questions for me, which I'm glad to answer. But he's like, "Well, when this when this is done, what else can I put behind it?" And I'm put, like, "Pump the brakes, buddy! <laughs> like, you got you know, you got a couple more weeks, maybe more than that. Just you know, just be patient." Um, so many yeah. people end up having to divide their hostas because they kind of overgrow. When is the best time to divide them, and what is the best method? You know, um, hostas are such forgiving plants that you can divide hostas almost any time of the year, except when they're dormant. Um, I tend to divide hostas in spring when they're shooting up. They're a few inches tall, but the leaves haven't unfurled yet. Um, but you can certainly divide hostas um, in summer. Um, once you get past sort of that hottest part of summer, it's actually a really good time to be able to go in there and, and do that as well. I 
I believe in the, um, at least for the home gardener, who's probably going to divide a hosta into like quarters or halves, probably not pull apart every single eye to create 15 plants out of one hosta. Um, for most home gardeners, I fully believe in sort of a, a deep breath and a sharp spade and a clean cut through it. And it's amazing how quickly you can divide hostas. And like I said, there's such forgiving plants that um, you replant that and give that uh, you know, a nice drink of water, baby it a little bit for a little for a short period of time and it will reward you with many more hostas to come. And hostas one hostas are one of those plants that can really tolerate the shade much more easier than a lot of lot of plants. Absolutely. And, you know, the one thing about, you know, if you do divide them when they're when they're in full leaf, sometimes the leaves get a little bit floppy. You can just kind of tie the leaves up and they don't look their best that year. But as long as they've got a good enough water and you've got them in a spot where they've got some shade um, and they're not stressed, they'll put down roots and they'll be fabulous the next year. Well, now with everybody kind of uh, getting into the swing of summer, uh, people are redoing their backyards, redoing their landscape, and edging their landscape. What is the right way to edge a landscape? And I'm thinking the answer is not just get the shovel out of the shed and just start hacking away. I think they're, you're going to give us a little more information and the proper techniques in which to, to move forward with this. Yeah, so, you know, first of all, of course, you want to define the area. You want to define the bed. So you can use, a lot of times, you can use a hose to sort of help get an idea of what you want that bed to look like if you're creating a new bed or expanding a bed. Um, and then in terms of edging, you know, there's there's permanent solutions and then there's sort of temporary solutions. And it all depends on the aesthetic you're looking for and how much money you want to spend on it. So some people will go... You know, you can do bricks or you can do permanent poured concrete curbings. Um, but the simplest and my personal favorite way to go is to just cut a nice clean edge between the grass and the bed. And, you know, the the secret to having a good edge between the grass and the bed in order to keep the grass from getting into your garden beds is to have a very straight edge um, on the grass side and then kind of a V that goes into into the bed side. And um, you, know, you can do this in multiple ways. Uh, you can use a, like a gas or electric powered edger to initially cut that. You'll still have to go back and um, clean up some of that grass and sod that you sort of created by cutting that. But you can also use a flat edge spade or there's half moon edgers specifically made for this purpose. And you just want to cut along that line that you've, you've defined. And, you know, keep in mind, again, that you want that straight edge on the grass side and then a V on the other side and clean it all up. And then, um, you know, throughout the summer, once you get that edge made, um, that will last for most of the summer, if not all of it, as long as you go back and sort of just clean up where the grass is kind of coming in there. And I use a long handled um, lawn shears for that. It's a it's about two and a half feet or three feet long and you can stand there and just chop along. But you can also use. Um, like a, a string trimmer turned upside down to go along and just kind of trim that grass really neatly in that edge. And that will keep that edge looking great and keep that, most importantly, keep that grass from growing into your beds because really that's what we're trying to do. And and just like any job, if you do it right the first time, the maintenance on that particular edge is going to be minimal compared to if you just, it's good enough, we'll finish it up next year, it won't be that bad and that grass creeps back in there very quickly yes it does it's amazing and of course you know a little bit of mulch um in your bed will certainly help that as well although what you don't want to do is fill that whole v up across um with mulch because you're just kind of creating a nice little area for grass to kind of jump back in but you're like you said with with all good jobs you know do it right the first time and then you you save yourself time in the end Well, you know, I'm with you guys. I love raised beds for a lot of reasons, one of which is not having to deal with weeds getting in your beds. Um, you know, especially if you're starting with a new garden area and you're trying to create a garden where there wasn't before, um, you, you do have to get rid of, of grass and in particular weeds. 
um, before you go there. And there's sort of you know three ways to do that. You can dig it out. Um, obviously, there's a lot of lot of labor involved in that, but you know that works. Um, you can smother it, which is sort of a longer term process. So some people will do. Um, a lot of people call it sort of sheet composting, where you'll put down um, cardboard and then you put some mulch um, or compost on top of that. But that's something that takes a bit to, to um, work. So maybe that's something that you might do in fall in preparation for a bed in spring. Um, you can also use plastic or something like that. But the idea is to smother those weeds and that grass out. Um, or for people who um, who are okay with using a chemical, you can use an herbicide um, applied very carefully according to the directions on the bottle. If that's something that people are comfortable with, of course, there are pros and cons with that that people need to you know, decide for themselves if that's the right move for them. Exactly. And that's such a good point is that there's a reason there's directions there and you need to follow those to a T if that's the route that you want to take. Um, but, you know, you can also try a combination of these things, you know, try digging them out or try smothering them. And if you need to, if you decide that's not working for you and you need to go to the next step, you can maybe take it to the next step. So people, it's one of those things people kind of have to decide for themselves, but they do need to you know, act with an abundance of caution if they're going to go the herbicide route. Right. And there are some weeds that I mean, that's just realistically, do I want to fight this for five to seven years or do I want to make a one application and, and get it out and deal with it that way? So, yeah, it, it's it's a personal uh, situation for personal situations on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you know at some point there's a, a um, you need to weigh the pros and cons of this. You know, if your plan is to create a meadow, if you want to create a meadow created for pollinators or something and you're going to replant everything with with wonderful pollinator plants you know maybe one application of herbicide that takes care of that problem and gets you to that end goal ultimately maybe turns out to have more benefits than cons if you want to grow vegetables and you want to get to that you know weigh that but especially when you're going into edible gardens do be careful with the herbicide um, and just, you know, approach that cautiously. Well, let's talk about gardens. It's never too late in our world, and I'm assuming your world as well, to start a container garden. And what are some plants that could be grown right now in the edible or even the ornamental world that uh, would be really good fit for early July, mid-July in most parts of the United States? You know, I love growing in containers, and I love especially for newer gardeners, I think containers are such a great way to get into it because there's very little commitment, very little cost involved in container gardening. So I know a lot of people are getting into gardening this year in particular. So if they just haven't gotten to it yet, it is not too late to get going. So, you know, when you're looking especially for um, edible crops for containers, first of all, one of the things that I always go to is herbs. Um, they're very easy to grow in containers. Um, in a lot of places, you'll still be able to buy plants. And in a lot of cases, um, this is actually a great time to be sowing things like basil for a uh, second crop. I mean, a lot of people have got basil in the ground already, but a lot of people are looking at second, second um, sowings of these things. So herbs work great in containers almost always. Um, also, there are some great varieties on the market of vegetables that are specifically bred to be smaller and be happier in a container. So look for those container varieties of things. And, and then especially if you're going to be sowing in July, look for things that have um, a, a short maturity date so that you know, like look for like a maturity date of you know 45 days or something. So you're going to be able to guarantee that you're getting a good harvest yet this year it's definitely too late to be thinking about like a 90-day tomato or something like that at this point but there's a ton of vegetables that are still good for that um and so you do want to you know take your time and sort of pick things and rather than just say i'm going to pick a zucchini there are some zucchinis that are just like 45 days and you could still do that in a container because there are actually container variety of zucchinis out there 
Um, beans, I think, are um, a pretty good thing to be sowing right now. You can certainly grow bush beans in particular in containers, um, work really well. And if you um, have a little bit of a semi-shaded area, um, I am a huge proponent of sowing lettuce, especially cut and come, ver cut and come again varieties. Um, you know, they don't love heat, but if you have them in this semi-shaded area, that works really well, even at this time of year. Um, just make sure you keep them, you know, moist, not wet, but moist. And of course, if you're growing in containers, always make sure you've got really good drainage. But but there is it's almost limitless what you can still grow in a container at this point. It's not it's you got plenty of time to get great food. And then for flowers, um, honestly, you can grow just about anything. Um, if you can find some flowers out there already growing, plant up a beautiful um, uh, a beautiful pot for yourself or combine it with edibles. Um, things like nasturtiums, which are beautiful flowers, but are also edible, are super easy to grow from seed and they're nice big seeds. So they're easy for kids to plant. If you want to get kids involved, um, plant up a pot of those or put those in with your vegetables in your container garden, um, because the sky's the limit on that stuff. A lot of great information, Aaron. We appreciate your time. How can people find your blog, find your YouTube channel and follow you throughout your growing season? Um, so people can find me at theimpatientgardener.com. That's my main website and my blog. Over on YouTube, it's YouTube slash um, The Impatient Gardener. And then I'm on all the social media channels as um, Impatient Gardener. So you can find me there as well. Well, Aaron, we thank you for taking time out of your day and to uh, not only educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners from across the country and all on all the stations that we're on. It was wonderful to talk with you both. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And when we come back, it's going to be your garden questions and our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raised beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit blueribbonorganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Looking to kill weeds without using dangerous chemicals like glyphosate? An all-natural weed killer may be just what you're looking for. Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is a concentrated herbicide derived naturally from corn. It's four times stronger than regular table vinegar, so it packs a punch against all kinds of pesky weeds. Use Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer to safely kill dandelions, crabgrass, clover, ivy, and more. It's perfect for driveways, pavers, fence lines, and other outdoor surfaces. Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer is an effective and powerful herbicide, but it doesn't stop there. It's also certified for organic use, so when used properly, it won't negatively affect soil or wildlife. Since Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is pure vinegar with no other additives, pet owners can let their pets out to play right after application. Search for Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer on Amazon.com today. We offer a hassle-free money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Conserve water, save time, reduce runoff, eco-friendly. Visit waterhoop.com. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. 
Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, winding up another program. Your questions at the top of the hour. We've got, uh, if you want to submit your question, you can do it a couple of different ways. You can go through our website, which is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and clicking on the question button. You could uh, send us an email at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com, or you can give us a call at one 800 927 uh, S-H-O-W. That's 1-800-927-S-H-O-W. We're going to go. we got a couple of calls that came in this week. We're going to go to uh, Michigan listening to us on WAAM 1600 AM and 92.7 FM out of Ann Arbor. Got a question here. Let's see what it is. Hello. My name is Ilona. I had two questions. One, um, cutworms. I try my hardest to grow sunflower seeds, and all the new saplings always get nipped off. Um, it's not rabbits because everything's fenced in. It's always chewed up around the edge of new, fresh little saplings. And moles and voles, I've tried everything. We have rich uh, soil here. It's sandy, but I've amended it, and I have very healthy soil with lots of worms, so... Um, I've tried the mole granule repellents. I've tried the little battery-operated noisemakers. Um, I've tried the poison worms, which probably does the best job, um, but they're just uh, uprooting everything, and I don't know what else to do. So I'm out here in Oakland County, Michigan. Thank you very much. All right, Holly, can we help her out with the uh, cutworms? Let's start with that problem uh, first. Sure. For the cutworms, you want to usually take some diatomaceous earth and sprinkle it around the plants, and that will generally get rid of the cutworm problem. As far as the moles and moles, Well, you can also do a collar, too. Oh, yeah, you can. Oh, yeah, that's right, the collar. So you could take, uh, like, a toilet paper tube or... Uh, make your own with or make your own with some cardboard yogurt, or yogurt, yogurt container. Cut the bottoms off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, make a little collar, and that will stop the cutworms a lot. And then for the moles and voles, unfortunately, it sounds like she tried a lot of options. Ex- uh, explosion, exploding, uh, you know, dynamite might be the answer for that. Um, <laughs> this is not a Looney Tunes. Uh, oh, no, wasn't it Happy Gilmore? Oh, Happy Gilmore, yeah, yeah. yeah or something like that. But yeah, um, she's she's. You're gonna have to continue with. The poison, if they are aggressive, unfortunately, as much as we don't like suggesting that, sometimes that's the only answer. And the, and the other thing you want to be aware of, the poison works. However, you want to be aware if you have like pets, uh, dogs or whatever the case is, these animals are going to die somewhere and though your pets may consume them or chew on them or whatever and they would ingest that poison, a hawk, uh, an eagle, whatever the case is, that's something you also need to be aware of. You're trying to prevent one problem uh just something to, to be cautious about. Uh, you can, I mean, you can try to trap them, but it's it is isn't always easy. Um, so that's that's what you you could do. Let's go to a caller from uh, Milwaukee, listening to us on Joy thirteen forty AM and ninety eight point seven FM. Hi, um, we removed an evergreen tree, and we want to reseed underneath. I was wondering, could you tell me? Um, I don't know what kind of soil to purchase for under there. Is it a special soil we should go with it? Or um, if you can give me some information, thank you. All right. We cut down an uh, evergreen tree, and now we want to resod that. Uh, what is the best options we have? Do we need to purchase new soil, special soil? Can we use what's already there? What's, what's the steps? So you can. what you want to do is you want to rake away the old 
uh, pine needles. Use it as mulch in your vegetable use garden. As, yeah, use it as mulch in your vegetable garden. And then you want to just seed. Now, if you feel that the soil might be a little bit acidic, you can just lay down a nice layer of topsoil. Don't mix it in. Don't mix it in. Just lay it down on the top and then seed maybe about an inch of topsoil and then seed with your grass. And then that will help. That will help that grass get established. Now, that's the easy answer. That would be the answer that Holly and I would go ahead and do the approach to. If that does not work because that soil is a little more acidic because it's been sitting there for decades, it's not like the you know neutral pH is like 7. It's not like that soil is 2. It may be you know 5-ish, somewhere in that range, high 4s, low 5s. If that grass doesn't take... Then you're going to have to get a soil test to see where you're at on that and uh, see if there are grasses that are more susceptible or more tolerable to a lower acidity than what you're, what you're trying to see, the El Cheapo stuff you bought on sale at your big box store type of uh, grass seed. Uh, i got time for a couple more, Holly. Let's go with uh, here the new gardener question here. A new gardener. I'm a new gardener. I have two questions. One, how will I know when I can harvest my onions? And two, do I need to cage my potatoes? They're getting very tall. They're kind of leaning into each other. Do I need to stabilize them? All right. For the onions, you will know when the onions are ready to harvest regardless. Okay, this is regardless if the bulb is a marble or a baseball. When the when the top growth or that, that top piece falls over and crimps right above the bulb, that's your indication that the plant's done. It's not going to grow no more because it's pinched off its vitals to feed the bulb and the uptake of nutrients at that crimp there. So regardless of what size your bulb is, that's when you know the onions are ready to harvest, whether you're happy with it or disappointed with it. When it comes to, what was the other one? Oh, the um, potatoes. You don't need to cage them. Uh, They will lean. They will fall on one another. Uh, If you're having very, very excessive growth of green on your potatoes, could be the variety. It could be an excessive amount of nitrogen in the soil because we, we, you know, say this over and over again if your plant is very large and very lush with green growth and you don't have a lot of production for example a tomato plant it's because there's so much nitrogen it's just sucking up all of it all of its uh, nitrogen it can and it doesn't focus on fruit production so uh, typical potatoes they're going to fall they're going to lean don't worry about it they're totally fine you don't need to cage them if they do are very very tall Un, un, normal, un uncharacteristically tall, you might have a, 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 a nitrogen spike in the soil you need to look at. Uh, I have a question here about canning. Here you go, Holly. This is for you. I'm using a salsa mix. Uh, I'm new to canning, and is it safe to uh, put in pint jars? Uh, we're not going to name the name of the brand because they're not sponsoring us. That's how the game is played. Uh, could I use half pint jars instead of the processing and process them for the same time uh, when I'm doing this mix? Yes, you can. So you can. It, it's a salsa mix. She's making salsa yeah. in in pint jars and half pint jars. Can she do the half pint jars for the same time she did the pint jars? Yes. So not not for all canning, but in this case with the salsa, salsa is pretty forgiving since you're going from a pint to a half pint it's okay you would not want to do that from a pint to a quart so since you're you're canning uh less but this is not the case for all canning but with this salsa and that mix yes well that will do it we are out of time and we thank you for yours if missed any portion of this program or you want to revisit it you can do that a couple of different ways. You can go to our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable and click on the Season 4 tab at the top of the page. Or you can uh, send us an email, and that will give you a listing of all Season 4 shows in uh, chronological order. Or you can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will send you the link for this program. Uh, you can check out past shows and videos on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com too. Tell your garden friends and your fellows uh, enemies in the garden uh, that this show's on the air. This is how our message gets heard. This is how our program gets spread. Join us next week on the show. We'll be talking about how to keep your grass green. All summer long, we're dealing with some heat in some areas. We're dealing with too much water in other areas. We're going to go over how you can keep that grass green er and healthy er all summer long, as well as five plants. And Holly, you laughed at me when I came up with this. Five plants that you can plant on your property for security 
Uh, so we'll go over what those may I be. I chuckled. I you, was like, you ha, ha, ha. Okay. okay. And authors, two of them, Jennifer Blais and co-author, uh, or Blais uh, Carmel, and her co-author of the book that she is going to be featuring, Isa Easton, will be with us. Plus your garden questions. That's all next week right here. Until next week, for... Holly Baird. I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.